Hello, and welcome to the Rockford Systems Machine Safety Compliance 101 webinar. We are ready to begin. My name is Carrie Halley, and I am the moderator for today's session. Your presenter is Mr. Roger Harrison, Director of Training, with over 25,000 hours of machine safeguarding standards and regulations training under his belt, and is a frequent speaker at the Precision Metal Forming Association, Fabtech, various safety councils, and other venues. Through his teaching methods, you will learn to interpret the OSHA and ANSI standards as they relate to specific machine applications and production requirements. You have arrived in mute mode so that the presenter can speak clearly without background noise. If you have any questions, please type your questions in the chat box at any time during the webinar. And we will address your questions to the best of our ability at the end of the webinar. Before Roger gets started, I wanted to take just a brief moment to introduce Rockford Systems to you. We are located in Rockford, Illinois, just outside of Chicago, offering quality machine safety solutions since 1971. As a trusted advisor to industry, Rockford educates organizations on how to interpret and apply the complex OSHA regulations and ANSI standards for machine guarding. In addition, Rockford offers a full suite of machine safety solutions, ranging from on-site risk assessments and machine surveys through product installation training and support, and culminating with ongoing compliance validation. Please visit our website, rockfordsystems.com, to learn more about our full range of machine safety lifecycle management solutions, join our mailing list, and follow us on social media. Our webinar topic, Machine Safety Compliance 101, was chosen as a response to the fact that annual injuries resulting from a lack of proper machine guarding are not declining at a significant rate. As reported recently in Safety and Health, a lack of machine guarding is consistently on OSHA's top 10 most cited violations report, moving in fact from number 9 in 2015 to number 8 in 2016 resulting in over $7 million in OSHA fines each year. The actual price tag for an injury is actually much higher than simply the OSHA citation because indirect costs must be taken into account, such as damaged facilities or equipment, medical expenses, lawsuits, lost productivity, and replacement personnel. Worst of all, these accidents can cause extremely severe, potentially life-changing injuries to employees or even death. It is estimated that workers who operate and, machine and maintain machinery suffer approximately 18,000 amputations, lacerations, crushing injuries, abrasions, and most profoundly, more than 800 deaths per year. In 2016 alone, 88% of the total number of OSHA machine guarding violations were classified as serious meaning one in which there is a substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result and the employer knew or should have known of the hazard. After a decade of dismal improvement, we need to make machine safety a top priority. Rockford estimates that alarming 50% or more of metal fabricating machinery in the U.S. do not comply with the critical safety requirements for guarding outlined by OSHA and ANSI. This majority non-compliance statistic applies to both old and new machines, and contrary to public perception, old machines are not grandfathered in. As part of ongoing market research, Rockford recently purchased a new mill drill and a new drill press from leading machine manufacturers. After undergoing machine surveys, both machines were found to be in dire non-compliance, brand new, out of the box. Any one of these violations would render the machine unsafe to operate, new out of the box, and subject to OSHA citations and mods. This topic will be explored fully in our February 7th webinar. So in summary, Rockford Systems is committed to helping your organization improve machine safety by offering a full suite of safeguarding solutions 
that not only reduce operator risk, but also improve productivity, cost savings, and overall productivity. Here's just a quick view of the topics that Roger will be covering. And for now, I will hand it over to Roger. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Roger Harrison. I'm the Director of Training here at Rockford Systems uh, and conduct 11 seminars a year, two and a half day classes here at our training center, as well as custom classes on the road. So happy to be doing this webinar with you today. As you can see, we're going to be covering OSHA regulations, keeping in mind that about half the states have a state approved plan, the rest use federal for OSHA. We're going to be covering ANSI, American National Standards Institute B11 series on metalworking machines, which have been out there since the 1920s in some cases. National Fire Protection Association, NFPA 79, the electrical standard for industrial machinery, along with NFPA 70E for arc flash issues. We've got a few references at the end for robot animation or automation to CSA or Canadian Standards Association, uh, which are very similar to European standards and regulations because that's where Canada got those. So with OSHA regulations, the most general thing is uh, 1910-212-A1, general requirements that require the employer to protect the operator and other employees in machine area from exposure to recognized hazards. Point of operation hazards, ingoing nip points, rotating parts, flying chips and sparks are all in there, but the one that gets the most attention is the first one, point of operation. Every machine has at least one point of operation, some more than that. That's where a lot of serious injuries occur, and that's why so much emphasis on that one. Safeguarding methods, well, the three that OSHA includes here at the bottom are just a few of those that we're going to talk about. Actually, you're better off to go to the ANSI B1119 safeguarding standard, which has five basic methods of protection, those being guards, devices, Distance, also known as safe holding. Location, also known as safe position of operator control. And safe opening. What we're going to concentrate on is guards and devices in this class. So in the next slide here, let's talk about risk assessment. Um, this is something that's been around since 2000. I think the first standard I ever saw it in was uh, industrial robots. So you've got severity of injury, probability, and frequency you've got to deal with. You go through the risk assessment process, uh, which we're not going to take time to do here, but we will have a webinar on in April, to figure out a hazard risk number for that machine. So you look at each of the three color groups, take a number to represent the exposure, stack it up against the scale to see what level of exposure you have which will then tell you what's appropriate for safeguarding, the level of exposure. So we've got severity, probability, frequency, and actually the fourth one is avoidance. That's going to come up later under press break safeguarding. Avoiding the hazard would be easier on a slower machine than a faster machine. So the press break safeguarding standard um, addresses slow speed safeguarding, something brand new in the ANSI standards, although it's been around in the uh, European regulations for a long time. So ANSI B110-2015, the safety of machinery and risk assessment is the standard you want to get a hold of to understand risk assessment on machinery. Just like B1119, ANSI standard, to understand safeguarding itself. On lower level hazard exposures, Consider awareness barriers for safeguarding. I'm talking about railings, chains, and cables. Now, these are not the same level of protection as a guard, no. Yes, you could crawl underneath them or step over the top of them, yes. But they're a lot better than just a yellow line on the floor. Because of the yellow line, you can inadvertently or on purpose step over the line. So this sets up an obstacle between you and the hazard. You have to make a conscious effort to get beyond it, along with a contact with it to get beyond it. 
So railings, chains, cables, they really should be accompanied by danger or warning signs. Now, general signs like the one you see in the top right corner, well, that's better than nothing, but ideally, or best practice, you'd have a specific danger or warning sign that lists the hazards in going beyond the chain, like sharp steel edges, moving coil stock, ingoing pinch points, things like that. So for lower level exposures, consider awareness barriers. Let's talk about point of operation guards, something that actually keeps you out of a hazard area. That's what you're looking at here. If you have a guard, according to OSHA, you cannot reach over it, under it, through it, or around it, even if you really tried. So uh, if you look at the left side of this guard, you see a reach-through hazard there, an opening big enough to get a small hand far enough through to get hurt. That's an issue. That's a problem you need to deal with. Also, down at the bottom of this slide, you notice the NXE considerations for transparent guards that came out in 2010. Uh, that's something that recognizes that polycarbonate guards lose their impact protection over time, especially if they're, they come in contact with cutting fluids or other industrial chemicals, or even with sunlight, they lose their impact protection. So point of operation guard requirements. If you look at OSHA regulations and if you look at ANSI standards, there's five things you need to consider. First of all, over, under, through, and around. We mentioned that, which actually comes out as an acronym, OUTA. This guard should keep you out of here. Secondly, you have a measurement scale for guard openings and guard distances to make sure somebody with a small hand can't reach far enough through the guard opening to become injured. Thirdly, you don't want pinch points between the guard and the moving machine parts. Good visibility into the point of operation is usually polycarbonate, but it doesn't have to be. Fasteners not readily removable means they want a tool to get into the guard. That's OSHA saying that, a tool. Now, if you have an interlock switch to back you up on that guard, you could get in there without the use of a tool and still be okay. So the first five items show up in OSHA as mandatory for guards. The last two on the bottom talks about materials strong enough to protect people from recognized exposures like a punch breaking and coming out towards the operator and free from sharp edges that could injure people. Those two show up only in the ANSI standard, not in the OSHA regulation, but they're common sense if you think about it. The guard opening scales that are available out here, and uh, we offer them, as you can see down here at the bottom, include the OSHA scale and the ANSI scale. OSHA scale have been there ever since OSHA came out, 1971. That scale is based on a woman's size six glove with average finger length. The second ANSI scale is based on a woman's size four glove with average finger length. Both of these initiated from the Liberty Mutual Insurance Company and the ANSI Standard Writing Committee. So if you took the OSHA scale and the ANSI scale and put them side by side as we've done here through exactly the same size guard opening, uh, you see that the OSHA scale in the top right photograph doesn't quite reach the dies when you lock it in place. That's good. You just passed the test on the OSHA scale. On the ANSI scale below it, the tip of the scale goes into the die, and that's a problem. Could you fix it? Mm, yeah, you could move the guard further back and or make the opening smaller. One of those two methods. Who's likely to use the ANSI guard opening scale? That would be insurance company loss, console, co loss control uh, inspectors, especially if they get into a plant where there's a lot of people with very small hands. Occasionally, that's what you see. Interlock switches. Perhaps some of you have guard interlocks that are just a push button or a lever arm interlock switch, uh, which, if it's working and you can prove it's working, may pass an OSHA inspection. However, the best practices are to use an interlock switch that's designed to be difficult to defeat, like the one in the lower left corner. Notice you have a unique shape or geometry on the key. So you can't fool that interlock switch by using a screwdriver or a piece of metal. You've got to have that size and shape actuator. So that's a safety feature on the newer best practice switches you don't have on the old lever arm or push button. In the top right, you've got a latching feature. 
Now the black tab is circled because when the operator closes this door, slides the latch over, the black tab goes into the body of the interlock switch and is locked in place by a solenoid. Solenoid locks it in place so you can't open the door again until the hazardous motion going on behind the guard has come to a stop. Function testing guard interlock switches is required by ANSI as a best safety practice before you start each new operating shift. One, to make sure the interlock is working, and two, to make sure it hasn't been cheated, which may be one and the same thing. So function testing guard interlock switches. See an example of a function test checklist, uh, which is something that uh, we offer, perhaps others as well. Look at the bottom here. Other function test checklists would include light curtains, two-hink controls, perimeter guards, and so on, because it's a universal requirement to check out your safeguarding, whatever that is, before you start every operating shift. Two-hand control is always better than a foot switch to initiate the cycle of the machine, because at least you know where the operator's hands are, occupied on the palm buttons. Whereas with a foot switch, you don't know what that is. But if you want to use the two-hand control as a safeguarding device, as is might be the case on a, or a power press where you're manually feeding one part at a time in the single cycle mode of operation, there are rules that you have to follow in order to do that and have it qualified as a safeguarding means. Those rules are found both in the OSHA regulations as well as the ANSI standards. Infrared light curtains have been out there since 1954. Dr. Irwin Sick invented these, and they were used in Western Europe through the 50s, the 60s, and then when the 70s came around, where OSHA was promulgated, there was another of other manufacturers that started making light curtains. Today, I think there's 20 some different manufacturers worldwide, and there's a lot of application for these. If you look on the left side, they can only be used on machines that can stop consistently and immediately anywhere in their stroke or cycle without damaging the machine the tooling, the work, or creating another hazard. Now, there's two different categories here, point of operation light curtains and perimeter light curtains. Point of operation light curtains have close channel spacing. So even if you were to reach through that vertical sensing field flat-handed, you would send a stop signal in time to keep from getting hurt if your hand kept going. So point of operation, uh, operation light curtains have a close minimum object sensitivity, which is the cell or channel spacing. Perimeter light curtains are designed for whole body protection, torso protection, walking through the sensing field. So the cells or channels can be much further apart, and that's okay. What you're looking at here is a mechanical power press with three different types of safeguarding. You've got light curtains, that's the yellow light bars there. You've got two-hand controls near the bottom. And you've got hard guards around the sides, the top, the bottom, and the back. What are the side guards for? To protect other people from getting in there. Whereas the light curtains, two-hand controls are for operator protection. Actually, that combination of three different types of safeguarding is very common on a lot of different types of machines, not just power presses. It's probably the most common combination of safeguarding that there is. How about a two-sided perimeter light curtain for whole body protection with three single beams that go around the corner with a mirror? Yeah, you can do that. Make sure you, in your bid spec when you buy new light curtains, that you tell the manufacturer how long of an optical shot you have and how many mirrors you're going through, if any, because that does decrease the signal strength or gain of the light curtain. By the way, the beam should be no more than 24 inches apart, and there should be no more than 6 inches between the lowest beam and the floor. Two things you can do with light curtains, muting and blanking. Muting means you sh automatically shut off the light curtain during the non-hazardous portion of the cycle, assuming there is a non-hazardous portion of the cycle. So it's got to be active for the hazardous po portion. You can shut it off or mute it during the non-hazardous portion. So usually to speed things up for productivity is a reason people mute a light curtain. Blanking is different and blanking is oftentimes abused because people overdo it. Now the one at the top, the top left photograph there, has blanker covers on the other end of the light curtain you can see them circled there. 
and I think what they blanked here is adequate. Light curtain's far enough away, and the blanking's low enough in the sensing field that I don't think anybody could reach in next to one of those scrap trays and get hurt. So the top one looks okay. The bottom one has a problem. There's 10 blankers stacked up in a row, so somebody could stand outside that light curtain, reach their entire arm through the sensing field into the moving dies, and never be detected by what's left of the effective cells or channels, you know, the channels that are still active. So the top one, okay. The bottom one, not okay. You see where it says no protection below this line? That's a dead zone line, which ideally would be marked on your light curtain. If it's not, I might suggest you find that line and do that. Mark it. Because there's no protection there. So if somebody were, say, seated in front of that machine and putting their hands in the point of operation to feed and remove the parts, they're using a foot switch. They think they're protected, but they're really not. They're below the active area of the light curtain. So easy solution would be to move the light curtain down a few inches to deal with that. Indicator lights on light curtains. You've got red, you've got amber, and you've got green to tell you what the status is. Now, those indicator lights are needed to do a function test procedure of the light curtain, something you should do before every shift. And uh, here's an example of a function test checklist for light curtains. Although, as you can see in the first line, this is generic. Is that what you should be using on a light curtain for function testing? Well, ideally, no. If your light curtain manufacturer is still around, you go online and get the make model specific function test procedure that they suggest for that light curtain. So don't settle for generic. The only place you'd use is a generic is where you have a light curtain manufacturer that's no longer around. So you have to start with something to develop your own procedures. Notice the photograph with the two black sticks being held by those two hands there. Those are test rods for light curtains. Uh, most light curtains require two test rods, a fat one and a skinny one. And their diameter is very specific. It's not like one size fits all. No. Got to have the right size test rods for that light curtain to wand the sensing field as part of the function test procedures. Safety distance is required for two hand control and for light curtains, so the operator can't beat the machine and get them into a hazardous area and become injured. So to do this on a machine like a power press, you have to measure the machine stopping time by interrupting mid cycle. Multiply by 63 inches per second, which is the average reaching speed. Come up with a minimum OSHA safety distance, which is what you see in yellow down there, 12 and a half inches. Is that really practical for a safety distance? On a small press, yes, because they stop pretty fast in general. What's in white at the bottom is the ANSI standard safety distance, which is significantly further away than OSHA, like 40, 50 percent further when it comes to light curtains maybe only 15 or 20% when it comes to two-hand control. So you're supposed to be consistent within your plant that has similar machines and within other locations that you have wherever they might be. You're supposed to be consistent in the type of safeguarding and the rules that you elect to follow. This is a portable stop time measurement safety device designed for calculating the stopping time which when plugged into a formula will give you the safety distance for light curtains or two-hand controls. If you have a newer control system manufactured in the last 15 or 20 years, you probably have a built-in stop time measurement device. You have older controls like relay logic controls that are older, uh, yeah, you probably need a portable device like this one. So you could purchase a device like this, or you could contract the service done. I know we have a service that does that here at our company to do stop time measurement tests. Those of you that happen to have mechanical power presses, you see that reference down here at the bottom, are required to use an interlocked safety block when you are adjusting or repairing dies while they're in the press. That's an OSHA mandatory thing. You see the chain with the yellow plug on it? When you pull that chain, it drops out the main motor power. You wait for the flywheel in the motor to come to a stop. Then you can place the safety block in the die. And what you're doing is propping up the dead weight of the slide in the upper die if the breaker counterbalance on the press should fail. 
It's a mandatory thing on a mechanical power press. On a straight side press like this one is, you may well require two safety blocks because it's tough to get a safety block large enough to hold back that much dead weight. So one on the front, one on the back, and they would both need an electrical interlock plug. Talk about press brakes for bending materials. This was last updated in 2012. And uh, as you can see, this operator is using a light curtain, the black light bars on either end, so that he can initiate the cycle with a foot switch, which brings the dies down to within a very small opening, like a quarter inch or less. Slide the part through the dies against the backstop. Make another press on the foot switch to initiate the bend. Now, once he comes down to the quarter inch, the light curtain is muted or turned off so he can reach in and hand support the part as it bends. That's referred to as foot down, foot through sequence. And yeah, that's legit to do it that way. Otherwise, you sometimes see palm buttons like two hand controls that you use to bring the machine down to within the quarter inch, place the part through the dies against backstop, use a foot switch to finish the bend. That's referred to as two hand down foot through sequence, and that's also a legitimate method of safeguarding. Now, both foot down, foot through sequence, and hand down, foot through sequence use the quarter inch safe opening that we discussed earlier. Hydraulic press brakes can also use a laser device, of which there's four or five different manufacturers. This is um, correctly categorized on the right-hand side there as a close proximity, point of operation, laser, active, optoelectronic protection device in the ANSI B113 standard. It's sometimes used, well, it's always used on a hydraulic press brake. You never see these on mechanical press brakes because mechanical are not stopping fast enough to justify the use of a device that's mounted with a zero safety distance. Remember that previous slide where we had a light curtain? Well, those are mounted about eight inches from the dies. That's the safety distance required. These require zero safety distance, which has two primary advantages. One is that you can handhold small parts up close, like this guy at the top. Handhold small parts up close. Down at the bottom, you got a part with a tall side leg a tall side leg that creates the same problem. And it's, that is, if you're using a light curtain, you have to blank out so many cells or channels that the light curtain's not doing you any good. So that's a real advantage on a hydraulic press brake is a laser safeguarding device. Danger signs, keep in mind, need both verbiage as well as graphic symbols, pictograms, they call them. So here's three specific situations where you could become injured on a press brake bending die. Grinders, oh yes, we all know about the eighth inch maximum opening between the work rest on a wheel on a bench or pedestal grinder. That's an OSHA mandatory thing. As a matter of fact, that's the most common machine guarding violation in the U.S. and has been for 45 years, ever since OSHA came around in 1971. Quarter inch maximum opening for the tongue guard up above is also a common OSHA violation. And you want to make sure people are following the rules in mounting the grinding wheels. So they use the right spacers, blotters. They don't torque it down too tight. And to make sure that they ring test the wheel before they mount it. That is to suspend the grinding wheel from its center hole and then tap it around its outside diameter with a non-metallic object like a piece of hardwood. Make sure you can ring the wheel like a bell a bell tone as opposed to the thud or cracked plate sound that you might get if you have a cracked wheel. You never want to mount a cracked wheel. Now when you start up a bench or pedestal grinder, they suggest that you stand off to the side for at least a minute because if that grinding wheel is going to shatter, it usually happens within the first minute. So uh, keep that in mind. Also the bolts or the fasteners for the wheel cover here there's some fasteners missing, which could be an, a possible OSHA violation as well. Here's a gauge to check the eighth inch for the work grass, quarter inch for the tongue guard on that grinding wheel, which is also something that we handle on our website. As far as metal saws, there's an ANSI B1110 standard for this. Of course, as far as OSHA is concerned, it's a 212 machine, general requirements. 
What's the main OSHA problem with these? They either don't have a blade guard or it's a misadjusted blade guard. So the one at the top looks to be mm, relatively well adjusted. The one at the bottom, though, has an exposure where the blade is supposed to be covered, and it's not. So that's the most common thing they look for on saws, whether they're circular saws or band saws. Pressure-sensitive mats here are being used on a horizontal tube bender. It's an L-shaped thing. Notice the yellow ramp around the edge of it, which has provisions underneath the ramp to anchor it to the concrete floor because people will shove these things out of the way if you give them the chance to do it, especially smaller, lighter mats. There's three different mats here. They're butted up next to each other, so there's no space to sneak in between, and that's good. They're also large enough so you have to take at least one, if not more, steps on the mat before you can get to the hazard to assure that the hazardous motion has been stopped by the time you get there. So the mats have to be large enough. So three things. Anchored to the floor, buttered up next to each other, and large enough. Radio frequency is an antenna system that gives off an invisible capacitive field. So the operator, in this case standing down, down there at the bottom, as long as she's got both feet touching the floor, she is a properly grounded object. So if, you reaches, if she reaches towards that antenna, gets within about you know, 16 to 18 inches of it, it sends a stop signal to the guarded machine. That's assuming the sensitivity is set properly because the sensitivity on these devices is adjustable inside of the control box. So if somebody gets a hold of the key to open the control box and turns down the sensitivity, you might have to come up, almost grab the antenna to cause it to stop. Drop probe devices, ring drop devices, halo devices, something that mechanically verifies that your hand's not in the wrong place as you cycle the machine. Most commonly, it's used on riveters, where you're hand-holding the part and using a foot switch. Now you have a protection device in the form of what you see there on the left. In our, in our company's case, it's referred to as a detective finger drop probe device on a riveter. So you see the probe that drops out of the control box? You pl place the piece part on the lower part of the machine. Step on the foot switch. First thing that happens is the probe drops down to just above the part. Then the machine cycles as long as it drops its full drop depth. However, if your finger is in there along with the piece part, which means the probe can't drop all the way down, it won't go. It's a presence sensing device that prevents the cycle only. So 95% success rate on riveters, only about a 65% success rate on spot, spot welders like the one you see on the right because you can't spot weld into a corner but they are applicable to both machines and some others, by the way, can use this device. Here we have an old engine lathe. <clears throat> the number one OSHA violation, number one accident that insurance company inspectors look for is that somebody left the chuck wrench in the chuck, forgot it was there, started the machine up and sent it flying. That has actually caused fatalities which is why over on the right side you see an example of a spring-loaded self-ejecting chuck wrench, which self-ejects. You have to hold it in there as you're using it, in other words. One more thing. At the top left corner of this lathe is a manual motor starter with stiff mechanical clicks to turn the machine on and off. problem with a manual motor starter is it doesn't give you dropout protection. Dropout protection. In other words, if the machine is running, and you suddenly lose power to it, the power's off for 15 minutes, power comes back on, yes, with this machine, it'll restart unexpectedly if the start button is engaged. With a magnetic motor starter, no, you'll have to come back to the motor start button. So I'll show you some magnetic motor starters later, but this one is mechanical and should be replaced. What you're looking at here is four different examples of chuck shields. I'm not talking about guards now. These are shields, which are hinged. And as you can see, each one of these is in the open or up position. So before you use them, you bring them down or to the closed position. This is not a guard. This does not give you the same level of protection as the over, under, through, and around we talked about before. Nor does this have to be electrically interlocked, at least not here in the United States. But it is required. 
because it keeps you from inadvertently coming in contact with the rotating work holder. So that's a chuck shield. Can you get electrically interlocked shields? Yes, the one on the left is electrically interlocked chuck shield. It's a European design. On the right is a chip coolant shield with a built-in electrical interlock switch. So yes, that would be best practice. It's what's required in Western Europe and Canada. Telescopic stainless steel sleeves to cover the horizontal rotating components like lead screw, bead rod, traverse rod, camshaft, stuff like that. Um, this is not clearly defined in OSHA, but it's certainly a best practice. And it came to light about five years ago where there was a young woman at Yale University that lost her life because she came into the um, shop in the middle of the night. She had a key to get in there because she was a supervisor of the shop, couldn't get enough machine time during the day, so she came in to finish her senior project in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, she did not adequately restrain her hair, was grabbed by one of these rotating components, and she died by asphyxiation, strangled by her own hair. So it's, I guess that's good evidence that a lot of these safety standards are written in blood. There has to be some fatalities for people to pay attention to them. The knockdown chips and coolant, you've got simple universal ball and socket shields like these. Well, I'm, but I'm wearing safety glasses. Well, the question is, are the safety glasses adequately controlling the chips? Or do you still have chips hitting you in the upper body, which is unacceptable, or collecting on the floor, which might create a slip trip hazard, which is unacceptable. So shields pick up where your PPE leaves off. You want to think of it that way. This is another example of a telescopic chuck shield. Actually, it's a European design with three segments of telescope into one another. Notice the visibility windows on the two bottom segments. Uh, you can also lock one segment up, like in that second one from the left there, depending on the length of the drill bit that you're using. So this is like a two for one. Yes, it knocks down the chips or coolant and drops them out the back. That's good. But it also restricts your access to rotating parts like the drill bit, the chuck, the shaft. So sort of a 219 mechanical power transmission cover. At the same time, it's a chip coolant shield. Area laser scanners have been, been around about 20-some years now, four or five different manufacturers out there. So most of the ones I see are on the left side for area guarding. Matter of fact, if you look at the lower left, what you got is that yellow thing. It looks like an eight cup Mr. Coffee, doesn't it? Sitting down there around ankle height, which sweeps a laser beam back and forth to give you a field of protection. Now there's two different zones. The light shading is a warning zone. The dark shading is a fault zone. You step inside the warning zone, you slow the robot down to creep speed, flash a light, beep a horn. If the operator keeps walking into the fault zone, it sends a stop signal to the guarded machine. Now those zones, the warning zone, the fault zone, are both programmable as far as their size and shape. You can program that right out on the shop floor with a laptop computer. And more importantly, you can change the configuration. If your parameters change, you can reprogram this thing, unlike the use of pressure sensitive mats, which they oftentimes replace, by the way. So this gives you a lot more flexibility. Safeguarding an automation cell like this is usually a combination of safeguarding, combination of light curtains, various types of guard interlock switches, pressure sensitive mats, things like that. Remember that there is a 2012 version of the U.S. Robot Safeguarding Standard. That's current, 2012. But the 2012 version does not address the fence height issue, which has become a problem with some fatalities where people sneak underneath the fence. So down at the bottom, you see 12-inch sweep and 60-inch height. That was a 1999 U.S. regulation. In other words, you could, you could have 12 inches open at the bottom, as long as you had at least a 60-inch total height from floor to top rail. That is really not adequate 
which is why the Canadians now use their 2003 standard, which I believe has been updated once since then, to say no more than six inches open at the bottom and 72 inches for total height. Now, I think that's what you're looking at in the right-hand photo, six inches at the bottom, 72 inches height, with a light curtain entry area on the front, which is fine. The one on the left, yes, I think that also has six inches at the bottom with an 84-inch height. That's even better because they're afraid of the end effector suddenly releasing a part if it's emergency stop and throwing the piece part over the top of the fence. That's why they increase the fence height. Down at the bottom, they brought it lower so people wouldn't crawl underneath it because that's where fatalities have occurred. But they started the automation sequence and then forgot something inside the cell. So they try and sneak underneath the fence. Those of you with conveyors, if you go to the website at the bottom, cmanet.org, you find five or six of these uh, color cards that you can plastic laminate and hang on the conveyor to teach people what the hazards are. So this is only two of them. There's four or five more of these, by the way. Uh, there's another manufacturer that you may want to jot down that has safety placards like this for conveyors, only they have them in both English and Spanish. That would be hytrol.com. That's H-Y-T-R-O-L.com. Hytrol is a conveyor manufacturer, but they also have safety signs that they offer. <clears throat> With conveyors, you oftentimes can use a grab wire e-stop cable, also known as a rope pull e-stop, in lieu of putting a series of red emergency stops along the line of the conveyor, because that could be a lot of stop buttons. So the grab wire cables can go a long distance, and they can be strung around the corner, as you see in the top left there. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see where there's a manual reset for the, for the uh, grab wire system. And there's a yellow cover over rotating components because remember, anything that rotates that could tangle up your hair or clothing is required to have a guard or cover up to a seven foot level. Now there's two basic principles at the bottom of this slide. You've got conveyors that start up automatically. You need an audible or visual warning device that you can see or hear at all points people may be present. And on the right, <clears throat> you've got a manual reset or start at the location where the emergency stop was initiated to resume operation. Actually, I read something that said that 90 some percent of conveyors are protected by operator location as is defined in the B20.1 standard. NFPA 79 is the electrical standard for industrial machinery that includes things like emergency stop buttons with four basic principles. You got a red mushroom shaped button, a manual latch, which you see is engaged on the left side, but released on the right side. So you have to release it to pop the button back up, go back to your regular controls and start up the machine. It's got immediate background that's yellow and you have it readily accessible to the operator. Four basic principles for emergency stops that again come from the electrical standard for industrial machinery, NFPA 79 which is not to be confused with NFPA 70E that contains the arc flash issues for people that have to work on energized panels um, <clears throat> and have a certain amount of protective equipment in order to do that. So actually your electrical and maintenance people should have both the NFPA 70E and NFPA 79. So 79 contains things like the rules for main power disconnects, motor starters, voltage reduction using step-down transformers, properly grounded circuits, emergency stops, and three different categories of motor stop controls. So on the left, you need a disconnect switch you can padlock in the off position. It's a flange type disconnect where the handle goes up and down, and yes, it's lockable only off. On the right, you've got a rotary type disconnect that's also lockable only in the off position. Notice the start button underneath that? That's a symbol of a magnetic motor starter because the push button is spring loaded, a spring loaded push button as opposed to that old mechanical switch that we saw on the engine lathe. There's also a red emergency stop button as you can see. So this stuff comes out of NFPA 79. A couple of questions that have come up. For a mechanical power press that you run in single cycle, do you need both guards and light curtains? Well, actually, 
No, here in the U.S. Yes, in Western Europe. You need both guards and light curtains. Also, question comes up. It's not listed there, but do you have to have two hand controls and light curtains? Well, again, not in the U.S., but yes, in Western Europe. Number two, what's the most common personal protective equipment used on grinders? Well, that's by far a full face shield. A full face shield, not just safety glasses, but for the last 20 years or so, most all plans I get into have a full face shield. Three, is a line marking the dead zone near the bottom edge of a light curtain required by OSHA or ANSI? Well, the answer is it's the ANSI standard suggestion as a best practice to mark the dead zone so that you can verify that people are not reaching underneath the light curtain. Number four, do all industrial machines require dropout protection with a magnetic motor starter like the one described? According to best safety practice in NFPA 79, yes, they do. So replace your manual motor starters with magnetic to give you that anti-restart feature. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Roger, for your excellent overview on machine safety. Uh, we are running a little tight on time, so we're going to have to skip the questions uh, that have been submitted in the chat box. We will get back to all of you individually. If you'd like to send a uh, direct email to Roger, uh, feel free to send your email to roger.harrison at rockfordsystems.com, and we will get back to you. So thank you so much for your participation on our webinar today. If you found this webinar helpful and would like to learn more, we invite you to register for future webinars or training seminars, both of which can be found on our website under education. Our next webinar is February 7th, debunking the top three machine safeguarding myths, which we'll cover in more detail the topic that was introduced earlier on safeguarding new machines. Uh, we are also offering the same Machine Safety Compliance 101 webinar in Spanish on March 15th. And April 4th, the topic will be Risk Assessment versus Machine Survey, which is right for your organization. Also, we do invite you to attend our in-depth two-and-a-half-day hands-on learning seminar at our headquarter location here in Rockford, Illinois. You can download all of this information on our website under education. Okay, that wraps it up for us today. Again, thank you so much, and be safe. Thanks, everyone.